that know he's innocent. And if they would just look for Suzanne outside of where they hypothesize Barry could have possibly buried her remains, they could find her. They're wrong. They're, they've got tunnel vision. And they looked at one person, and they've got too much pride to say they're wrong and look somewhere else. Time. Time. The answer is time. I got nightmares in my head. I feel thoughts build up until I can't feel. My mind fills up into a creature. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Do you remember Barry's defense lawyer's words? that Barry was the most scrutinized, dissected, surveilled individual minute by minute, hour by hour, using law enforcement cameras posted by his home, phone taps and GPS devices placed on his car, all during the time frame of her disappearance and the years following. That is what uh, Iris Aiton said barely two weeks ago. And I think the critical question here is, what time frame? When did that time frame start? And besides that question, there's also the details of those of, of that surveillance. And we're going to be dissecting and scrutinizing that in this analysis. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. If you're finding this analysis worthwhile, please like, share, leave a comment. You can also hit the thanks button and let's get started. So just to continue from her statement, she said at no time that the FBI, CBI, Chaffee County Sheriff Office or the DA's office pinpoint or even generally claim that Barry was in any area south of his home near Moffat or anywhere near Sawatch County at any relevant time frame. Well, as you know, and we've reported on this quite early on on this channel, one of the defense's own exhibits places Barry's vehicle in Creststone, not far from Moffat. In fact, it's about four miles away. When, we don't know. So she also went on to say it would be ludicrous for anyone to now try to fit the now known facts to prior false assumptions and accusations. I'm not actually sure what that means. Um, and um, it seems like she's saying one shouldn't even try to think about anything given the... <laughs> new situation. But one thing we we do need to be clear about is when did the cops start suspecting Barry or putting him under surveillance or putting his home under surveillance or putting his vehicle under surveillance. Bear in mind, all of that takes time. You've got to get warrants, right? And so that's quite an important question. What is the time, but the time frame between Suzanne's disappearance and the surveillance layer being in place. Now bear in mind, as late as May 14th, four, arguably five days after the incident, Barry put out his, Dear Suzanne, if if anybody has you, uh, appeal on Facebook. And at that point, I don't know if you remember, at that point, people weren't sure what had happened. Some people thought she may have fallen off her bicycle, she may have gotten lost, she may have left for a period, right? There, there was a sense that maybe she had not run away, but uh, just left. That was also the contention in the Kelsey Barrett case that the um, accused there basically said that Kelsey had maybe just wanted some time for herself and maybe went to visit her mother, right? So it took some time for people to realize something serious had happened. Now, it, we also know that it took months for the cops to confirm that Suzanne was having an affair. She didn't get that information from Barry. And also, and what that meant was that the marriage had been on the rocks after all. And that then uh, made Barry, uh, to some extent, a much stronger suspect than he had been to begin with. One of the things I think the neighbors, I'm not sure if it was the neighbors, but some people... I read this in the affidavit that some people said the place where the bike went off the road makes no sense because it wouldn't go down there um, perpendicularly at a right angle. You would tend to go off um, to the side. Anyway, the other thing is even when Barry was under surveillance 
After his release from jail, we were told his ankle monitor signal couldn't be picked up in the Puma Path area due to spotty reception. Anyone remember that? Let's uh, go into the media narrative from Fox News. Quote, a Colorado judge on Wednesday, that's in October 2021, that's about a year and a couple of months after the fact, a year and about five months after the fact, um, ruled that Barry Morphew, charged at that time with murdering Suzanne Morphew, could continue living at a luxury Airbnb rental home in the same neighborhood where the couple once resided. In other words, in the same area where Suzanne went missing. Even though, get this, even though his GPS monitor has no reception there. Now, they had a, a hearing about this. This was a matter of public record where they discussed this. And the 11th Judicial District Judge Patrick Murphy said, I can't legally make Barry Morphew move from the property that he was staying in. It was known as the Cushman home. Um to somewhere else. Now, it is interesting that Barry, like the McCanns, you may remember the, the McCanns moved out of their apartment to, first of all, a neighboring apartment in the Ocean Club and then to a villa. I've been, I've been to the Ocean Club. I've been to that villa. The villa's barely a mile away, right, after, after moving out. And so... So like them, he nevertheless chooses to live relatively close to the area where the incident happened. Why do you think that is? It's not as though his daughters are still living in the house he, and he could live anywhere. Anyway, the rental, according to this article, was located in a wooded area. Well, we know that the area of the house is, is a similarly wooded area with spotty cell reception. I've been to that area myself. I've also driven from uh, Puma Path to, to to most of the way to Denver, and almost that entire way that there's very little cell reception. I would almost say there's more. Um, how can I put it? There's more no cell reception. There's more of an absence of cell reception than actual reception. Anyway, a day after Barry's release on bond the executive director of Intervention Incorporated, a private probation provider in the 11th district. He wrote to inform the court that Barry Morphew had indeed reported to be fitted for a GPS monitor. But, get this, that GPS monitor was unable to pick up a GPS or cell signal in the area of the defendant's home. So, so much for the defense attorney's contention that he was surveilled minute by minute. Anyway, due to this lack of GPS and cell signal, the GPS monitor is unable to provide any communication, any information, any location points where the defendant reaches the area, uh, sorry, when the defendant reaches the area of his residence. Due to the lack of communication and location points, intervention is unable to provide the court with any battery or, and this is so important, Tamper alert information. So, if Barry removed this bracelet, would would um, would it record that? Would it be able to show that? And it seems to be the answer is no. They say uh, unable to provide the court with any tamper alert information when the defendant is at or near his residence. Intervention respectfully requests further direction from the court on continued GPS monitoring requirements. So I don't know. I don't know whether it's a fact that maybe there was a locking mechanism that that you couldn't remove this bracelet. Maybe that, that's also possible. But this does seem to indicate the device couldn't provide uh, tamper alerts. Uh, I, I don't know whether it's waterproof. Whether you would normally take it off and be allowed to take it off if he, you know, took a shower or something. Um, that's detail that I simply am not aware of. In any event. It should also be noted that the intervention coordinator in Chaffee County was accused in the same article, and I'll put a link to it in the description, of having a social relationship with one of the Morphew children. Now, I'm not sure if I understand this part correctly, but it seems the private company who supplied the GPS monitor was friends in some way with a Morphew family member. 
and Barry was also permitted to leave the county to service and maintain the GPS unit. What does this mean? Um, well, maybe there's a bit of a conflict of interest there, but in any event, when the Executive Director of Intervention Inc. informed the court that Barry had reported to be fitted for a GPS monitor, they acknowledged that they were unable to pick up a GPS or cell signal in the area. And so the question is, I'm not sure if this is a fox guarding the hen house scenario, but it does seem to, in terms of the circumstances we're in now, it does seem to provide law enforcement with an argument, potential, a legal argument, for a window of opportunity. I'm saying potentially, um, you know, without further detail, it's hard to know how strong that argument might be. But I think they'll likely have to do better than just that to prove that Barry was or had been in the area of Moffat. Just the fact that his bracelet didn't work doesn't necessarily mean or prove that he was in the area. It simply means that he could have, could have possibly um, been in the area. Now, this also came after a woman who FBI investigators believed to be Barry Morphew's girlfriend, uh, that, that, that was Shoshona Dark, was arrested for trespassing at the Puma Path property. So at the same time that Barry had this bracelet, or uh, monitor, Shoshona, I think it's a Shoshona, was apparently moving around the Puma Path property. Curiously, Barry at that time, this is October 2021, was paying rent at a residence, in other words, paying money, ostensibly for rent, at a residence in Salida, where Shoshona Dark lived. Now, if he's not staying there, is he, is he not subsidizing her living arrangements? Because he wasn't living there himself. He was living at an Airbnb property not far from the Ritters. Potential witnesses in a trial, they were actually the neighbors who called 911 on Mother's Day. He was staying close to them and obviously close to the fabric of the incident itself. Of course, another scenario is that whoever killed Suzanne instructed a second person. He wouldn't have to necessarily go and, you know, bury someone somewhere. He could have instructed somebody else to move and dispose of her body. Hence the poor attempts at burial at her final resting place. There, there was an accomplice in the Frazee case in terms of the disposal. I've written a book about that called Murder Most Foul. Was there one in this case as well? Food for thought. I'm not going to take it further than that. Uh, I will be covering and reviewing the uh, Kate and Armstrong case. I covered it when it was happening, you know, when it was a developing story. And now it's going to the courtroom in, a, in about the next two weeks. I'm actually intending to be in that courtroom sometime in November. So uh, look out for that. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys next time.